evening. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study, November 16th, here at Bible Believers Community Church, where the name says it all. Amen. So, sure are glad to have you join with us today. Uh, we're studying the book of John. We're in John chapter 8. May as well start turning there. We're in John chapter 8, and we'll be starting with verse uh, 53 we get ready to go. Now, here in America, the elections are over, and there's a lot of people that are upset. They were expecting a red tsunami, and they wound up with hardly even a ripple, if even that. And uh, don't be discouraged, folks. Don't, don't get upset. Don't be mad. I mean, God's in control, and the world's got to get bad for the Lord to take the church out of here and for the tribulation to begin and for this thing to wrap up, the world's got to get bad. Now, you, you say, are you saying the world's going to get bad? It might. It's in the Lord's timing. It's not in our timing. It's not our desires that make the difference. It's God's plan. Jesus, as we were, as we've been studying the book of John, he continually references his hour. His hour is not yet come, etc. God has a timetable. And things are going to happen exactly the way he wants it to happen. Now, with that being said, uh, I've heard Christians that say you shouldn't even vote because you might be voting against God. God's in control of the vote. Now, you should vote. You should go and exercise your freedom in America to vote and try and, and keep a positive thing happening within the country as best you can. But if... if conservatism and if uh, godly values fail, that's the times we live in. And Jesus talked about those times and how bad they were going to be. And he says, let not your heart be weary. Um, he, he talks about when these things happen, rejoice because you're seeing the truth of what I proclaimed. And so don't let your heart be weary. Keep going. Keep doing the best you can and keep trying to have what influence you can. Amen. So we're in John chapter 8. My nose is tickling here a little bit. Verse 53. It says uh, the, the Jewish leaders are talking to uh, Jesus who said that uh, Abraham had seen his day. And uh, they pointed out in verse 52 that Abraham died. And verse 53, Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But, woe, but I know him and keep his saying. Verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we do thank you for this day. We praise you. We love you. We thank you for the results of the election. We praise you for that. We thank you that your time clock is going without a hitch, just clickety, clickety, click, the way you want it to go. We praise you, Lord, that you're going to win this battle. We praise you that you're going to win the Lord. We pray the, the war. We praise you, Lord, in all things. And we love you. And we pray for your blessing on this service tonight, Lord, that you be with us and guide us, direct us, help us to see truth, help us to teach truth, and help that truth to just permeate our souls and our bodies and our spirits. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So last week we asked the question, how did Old Testament saints get saved? We then, through the scriptures, comparing scripture with scripture, because that's how you find out what the Bible says, is you compare scripture with scripture. Uh, we showed how it was impossible 
for Old Testament saints to be saved by looking forward to the cross, which is what a lot of churches teach. This entire concept was started because of verse 56 of our text, which states, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it. And so we talked about how some teachers have twisted this scripture as a proof text that Abraham was saved the same way that we're saved in the church age, and that's nonsense. The main problem with that is the verse doesn't say that Abraham got saved. Jesus didn't say Abraham rejoiced to get saved and he got saved. He said that he saw his day. That's the whole context of it. And so, uh, the how did Abraham see Christ's day? Well, he saw it in Genesis chapter 22, which we looked at last week. Uh, we saw how Abraham saw Christ's day. Abraham was uh, instructed of God to offer his son of promise as a sacrifice. And Abraham was obedient to that command of God and he offered Isaac up as a sacrifice. But God stopped him because Isaac wasn't, he was a type of Christ, but he wasn't the Christ. He wasn't the Messiah. And so God was showing Abraham that his son, God's son, God, Abraham told his son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. He saw Jesus' day. And so, um, and that's how he saw it. Abraham, going to comparing his salvation with our salvation, Abraham was never adopted into God's family. We are. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5. Ephesians 1, 5. This never happened to Abraham. This happens to a church age saint. No other... Uh, saint gets saved this way. So Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5 it says having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now just like probably most scriptures there's major religions that have taken that verse and twisted it. Calvinism is one of them saying that you're predestinated to salvation. The idea is that God predestined some to get saved and he predestined some to go to hell. And that's just not biblical. God's not willing that any should perish. What it's talking about is it's talking about those who accept Christ as their Savior, they're predestined, predestined or predestinated, predestined would be the proper word. They are predestined to be adoption of children by Jesus Christ unto himself. And so uh, Abraham didn't have that. Abraham was not adopted. He did not become a son of God. For that sake, neither did Isaac or Jacob or any other Old Testament saint. That, this is a new dispensation. That's why this church is a dispensational church. And you say, well, I've been warned dispensations are evil. No, dispensations are how you rightly divide the word of truth. Divisions. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing, <laughs> rightly dividing the word of truth. There's divisions in the word of truth, and it's a Bible word that calls them dispensations. And so we shouldn't be afraid of it. It's used in the Bible. If you have a concordance, look up in your King James Bible, the word dispensation, you'll see it's used, I think it's in five or six different verses that God refers to dispensations, that Paul refers to dispensations. Now, so Abraham was never adopted into the family of God. Abraham also was never in the body of Christ, which we are. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. First Corinthians 12, 12 says, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. So, 
Uh, another verse that gets twisted in different theological circles saying, see, you have to be baptized to be saved. And I'd agree, but not water baptism. You have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, uh, the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You, the minute you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you are baptized spiritually into the body of Christ. It's a baptism made without hands. The Bible refers to it. Look over mm -hmm. in Colossians. And so um, uh, Abraham was never uh, spiritually circumcised like the church age is. We get a spiritual circumcision. Look at Colossians chapter 2 and verse 11. Colossians 2. This never happened to Abraham. It never happened to Isaac. It never happened to Samson. It never happened to any um, um, any Old Testament saint. This is a different dispensation. So a sec or, uh, Colossians chapter 2 verse 11 the Bible says, In whom ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism. See, that baptism isn't a water baptism. There's no water mentioned anywhere here. It's the spiritual baptism. Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, which means brought back to life, together with him having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Well, all that took place, but it, none of that could have taken place until the cross. The Bible says nailing it to his cross. Abraham didn't have a cross to nail it to. That hadn't taken place yet. Isaac didn't have a cross. Samson didn't have a cross. Moses didn't have a cross. And I could go on and on and on. Joshua didn't have a cross. The Old Testament saint was not saved the same, we, the same way we are, and they aren't the same... Uh, relationship with Christ that we have. We're the body of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. And they're not. And so you say, well, wait a second. If we're the body of Christ, how can we be the bride of Christ? The Bible clearly teaches that when a husband and a wife come together, they become one flesh. And so Abraham didn't go to the third heaven when he died, which is what's promised to be absent from the body for the New Testament saying is to be present with the Lord. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 1. It says, Now consider... Oh, I'm in 1 Corinthians. Let me get to 2 Corinthians. And if I get to 2 Corinthians, it'll say what I want it to say. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 1, it says... It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. So we can um, speculate on who this person was that Paul is talking about, but that's not fruitful for our study here. The point is, is that this person went out of the body. Paul said he couldn't tell whether in the body or out of the body, but there's not really examples except one which would be the Apostle John going to the third heaven without having died. <laughs> Amen? And so some folks will say, well, that proves that this is talking about the Apostle John, which it doesn't prove that at all because this tale that was given by Paul, this historic event that was given by, it's not a fairy tale, but this historic event which was given by the Apostle Paul happened before John ever was in Patmos, happened before his condemnation, happened before 
he was given the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so um, it's not the Apostle John just by comparing Scripture with Scripture. So Abraham went to the paradise in the center of the earth, and that paradise was called Abraham's bosom, which is different than when we go up to the third heaven when we die. We don't go to paradise in the center of the earth. You say, well, where do you get that? Look at Luke chapter 16 and verse 19. Luke 16, 19. Now this is the historical account of the rich man and Lazarus. And it gives Lazarus' name, but it doesn't give the rich man's name. And you say, why is that? Well, it's because the rich man was not saved. His name was not recorded. Lazarus was saved and his name was recorded. So you're in Luke chapter 16. Go down to verse 19. It says, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Now that's just pretty much disgusting <laughs> if you stop and envision that in your mind. Um, look at verse 22 and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom so this Old Testament saint when he died he didn't go to the third heaven he went to Abraham's bosom uh, continuing on the rich man also died and was buried he didn't go to Abraham's bosom verse 23 and in hell that's where the rich man ended up. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now we're going to pause there, because I think there's some significant things to be um, brought out here. One is, uh, even Billy Graham, towards the end of his life, he said he did not believe that hell was a place of fire and torment, and yet clearly, Jesus, talking about the rich man and Lazarus, clearly, clearly states that he was in torment, number one. Number two, the flames. There were flames. That's hell, torment and flames. And he was in these torments and all he wanted was just a drop of water on the tip of Lazarus' finger to touch his tongue just for that instantaneous, minute fraction of a second relief that he'd get from that water touching his tongue. Now let's go on with verse 25. But Abraham said, Son, Remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. Listen, if, there, if you know any rich person that's not coming to Christ, let them hear this message. Let them read this passage of scripture because there's not going to be any mercy given to that rich person when in hell, even though they might repent with tears at that point, at that point it's too late. And so, verse 26. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. So, in the center of the earth, there were two cavities with a great gulf in between them. One half was Abraham's bosom, which was a holding place until the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the other half was hell. And when Jesus died and was buried and rose again the third day, it says that he went to hell and he led captivity captive. He took all those Old Testament saints that didn't go to the third heaven. They went to Abraham's bosom and he led them up into heaven. Uh, that's biblical. That's what the Bible teaches us. And then the Bible says that after that event, that hell hath enlarged herself. So hell has taken over that entire chasm that was in the earth. And so Abraham didn't have his sins taken away like we have our sin. When we get saved, 
Our sins are taken away. They no longer exist on our soul and our spirit. Now, they're still in our body, but this body is going to be destroyed. And the Bible teaches us that we're going to get a new body. But Abraham's sins, they weren't taken away. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4. Hebrews 10, verse 4. It says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. So the Old Testament saint, when they sinned, they were to bring a bull or a goat into the temple to sacrifice it for their sins. And all that would do is it would show obedience. But the blood of those goats, the blood of those bulls, they had not they didn't have the physical capability of taking away sin. Abraham was not cleared of his sin, but he was forgiven. Look at Exodus chapter 34 and verse 7. Exodus 34 and verse 7. Hopefully you're getting something out of this because I'm going to tell you what, there's very few Preachers that understand the differences in salvation and the different dispensations. And that causes a muddled up mess that doesn't even make sense. So Exodus chapter 34, verse 7, the Bible says, Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and trespasses, or excuse me, let me start over again. Keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that while by no means clear the guilty. See, he wasn't cleared. He was forgiven, but he wasn't cleared. Uh, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. So he wasn't cleared. It, he, the blood sacrifice that clears the sins had not yet taken place. The Bible teaches that when Jesus went to hell, when he died and was buried, that three days he spent in hell, and it says he preached to the folks down there. He preached to the Old Testament saints. And I'm sure that they accepted him as their Savior, and he led captivity captive. Amen. So King David was concerned about his sin because he knew that he could lose the Holy Spirit. Look at Psalm 5111. Psalm 5111. Psalm 51, verse 11, David in the psalm says, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. That's a major difference. When we get saved in this dispensation, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit comes in and dwells inside of us, and we can't lose our salvation. We cannot lose the Holy Spirit. David knew that he could, and he was after his sin with Bathsheba, he was begging God Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And I'm sure that David got saved. So the New Testament saint cannot lose the Holy Spirit. Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 37. Romans 8, 37. I'm showing you differences to prove that the Old Testament saint and the New Testament saint are not the same animal. They didn't get saved the same way and they don't have the same characteristics and they don't have the same rewards if you will they don't have the same uh, relationship with christ so romans chapter 8 and verse 37 the bible says uh, let's go to verse 35 who shall separate us from the love of christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written for thy sake are they killed all the day long we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The New Testament saint cannot lose his salvation. He cannot lose the Holy Spirit. So David, 
he taught salvation by works. And we're not going to go read the whole thing, but go read Psalm 24. Uh, turn to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. 22nd Psalm. But read all of Psalm 24. He teaches salvation by works. Look at Psalm uh, 22 and look at verse 22. He says, Rob not the poor because he is poor, neither oppress the afflicted in his gate, for the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoiled them. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. You see, he could lose his salvation in David's teaching. You have to work. You have to, you have to do certain things. Verse 26. Be not thou one of them that strike hands or of them that are sureties for death. Striking hands is shaking hands. That's what they called it in the Old Testament. Uh, if thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take away thy bed from thee, from under thee? Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. So, David is teaching that it takes works. Uh, the New Testament Christian cannot lose his salvation. You say, well, then what keeps them from living like hell? The fact that they're saved and the Holy Spirit's dwelling inside of them. But beyond that, just because you can't lose your salvation, it doesn't take away the fact that you can lose a lot of other things. You can lose your testimony. You can lose your rewards. You can lose your position uh, in, in Christ, not that you'll lose your salvation, but the rewards that you get and what you might have had. You know, if you look at the examples that Christ gave, he gives some of his uh, servants uh, rulership over 10 cities. You might lose that. And so this all brings us right back to 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There are divisions, and God calls those divisions dispensations. So that's why there's hundreds of thousands of Christians who believe they can lose their salvation. They don't divide the word of truth. They don't rightly divide the word of truth. They see examples of David, of Solomon, and others where they teach that you can lose your salvation. There's tribulation books that teach you can lose your salvation. And one verse that comes to mind is, uh, he that shall endure to the end shall be saved. Well, that's talking about a tribulation. It's a different dispensation. We don't have to endure to the end. Uh, matter of fact, just the opposite, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, but there's a, a portion in the Bible where it says, what if I get so backslidden that I deny Christ? And the answer was given, uh, though you deny Christ, he will remain faithful. He cannot deny himself. He's dwelling inside of you. You cannot lose your salvation. And it's not a contradiction that some verses teach that you can and some verses teach that you can't. The fact that preachers mistaught that stuff is what leads a lot of lost people into saying the Bible's not real. The Bible's full of contradictions. The Bible can't be the Word of God. The Bible's just man's fairy tale of how man ought to live. Well, if you rightly divide the Word of Truth, there are no contradictions, not a single one. Everything lines up perfectly, but you have to understand dispensational truth in order to find the solution to what appears to be a contradiction. So back to our text in John chapter 8, Jesus told these men that they would die in their sins. He said it in verse 21, and he said it in verse 24, ye shall die in your sins. They are going to die in their sins after living a righteous life. Now, by man's standard, these are the religious leaders. They lived a righteous life. They tied of everything. They followed all of the traditions of the Jewish faith. They washed their hands before a meal. They prayed out in the, in the streets. And they these, these men, by men, manly standards, lived a righteous life. Um, but there's none righteous, no, not one, according to Romans. Uh, look at Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel uh, chapter 18 and verse uh, 16. Ezekiel 18, 16. 
Ezekiel chapter 18, uh, 16. This is talking about uh, the life of a priest. It says, Neither hath oppressed any, hath not withholden the people, neither hath uh, spoiled by violence, uh, but hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment, that he hath taken off his hand from the poor, that hath not received usury nor increase hath executed my judgments, hath walked in my statutes. He shall not die for the iniquity of his father. He shall surely live. And so as we continue going down that, um, well, let's just go all the way to verse 24. As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, spoiled his brother by violence and did that which is not good among his people, lo, even he shall die in his iniquity. You say, yet say ye, why? Doth not the Son bear the iniquity of the Father when the Son hath done that which is lawful and right and hath kept all my statutes and hath done them, he shall sur surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall not die, or it shall die, excuse me. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither the Father the Son, and it goes on and on and on. Uh, these men, by men's standards, lived a righteous life, but God's standards are different than man's standards. God knows your heart. He knows when you do the right thing for the wrong reason. He knows your motives. He knows when your motives are not right. And his commentary on man, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. And so uh, go back to our text in John chapter 8, look at verse 57. Verse 57. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? You know what the answer to that question is? Of course. Of course Jesus saw Abraham. Go back to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were created by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. Drop down to verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among men. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so before this world was created, Jesus was. Jesus observed Adam and Eve in the garden. Jesus observed the serpent. Jesus observed Cain and Abel. Jesus observed the flood with Noah. Jesus, Jesus saw them all. <laughs> and Abraham. He saw them all. And so, uh, hast thou seen Abraham? Yep, he saw Abraham. He saw Abraham probably face to face. Matter of fact, uh, I would suggest, can't prove it, but I would suggest that when the angel of the Lord came to Abraham to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, that that was the Lord Jesus Christ talking face to face with Abraham. And you say, well, I choose not to believe that. Have yourself a fit. It's a free country. You can believe whatever you want to believe. But Jesus saw Abraham. Jesus saw every human that ever lived. Jesus intimately knows, even with, I think we're pushing 8 billion people in the world, maybe it's 7 billion, I don't know, I lose count, you know, give or take a couple hundred mil thousand million. <laughs> uh, Jesus knows every single one of them intimately. He knows the very details. As a matter of fact, the Bible says the very hairs of our head is numbered. And so uh, Jesus saw Abraham. He saw him back when he was Abram, before he got... Uh, an Easter celebration where he was given a ham. He was just Abram. Now he's Abram ham. <laughs> he was given, never mind. So he saw him when he was born. He saw him when he still lived in Ur of the Chaldees. He saw him in Haran and Bethel and Hai and Beersheba and Hebron and Gerar. <laughs> he saw him in every one of those places. Now, Jesus' hour is coming on quickly and he doesn't hesitate here to engage in this minor bit of quibbling, so he cuts right to the chase. He, he, you know what? He, they're, they're quibbling over nothing. And Jesus eventually has enough and he cuts right to the chase. They said, have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said in verse, Abraham, in verse 58, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, I am as God. And they knew exactly who he was talking about. They knew that Jesus, right with that response, was claiming that he was God Almighty. Here, he, he is the only I am of the entire Bible. 
you find it, look at Exodus uh, 3, 14. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14. You're going to see God introduces himself as I am. Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Um, look at verse 15. And Moses said unto God, 13, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Verse 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And so when Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, they knew exactly what he was talking about. This isn't ambiguous. Jesus is claiming to be the creator of the universe, which brings all modern day philosophies into question. It brings them all into question. The world wants to compromise, probably to feel comfortable and... Uh, and protected. So they say such things as uh, Jesus was a great teacher. No, that's a false philosophy. He wasn't a great teacher. He was God. Or they say Jesus was one of the greatest prophets. That Islam would say that Jesus was a great prophet. He was the greatest prophet of his time. That's what Islam says. They will make those type of comments yet fail to acknowledge that he's God. And he is God, which makes him more than a great prophet, which makes him more than a great teacher. The problem with the philosophy is uh, that if he is not who he claimed to be, then he's a liar and he's not a great teacher at all. He's a liar and he's not a, a great prophet at all. Look at Deuteronomy 18.22. Deuteronomy 18.22. You say, boy... Pastor, you sure go to a lot of Bible verses. Isn't it good? That's what makes this church Bible-believing because we believe the Bible. Amen? So, Deuteronomy 18, uh, 22, it says, When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is a thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. The Bible, there's other verses that say that they should be put to death if they false, falsely prophe prophesy. So, if Jesus is not God, which he claimed to be, he wasn't a prophet at all. We shouldn't fear him. We should eat, drink, and be merry. Uh, you're in Deuteronomy 18. Uh, go to verse 20. Verse 20. But the prophet which shall presume to speak any word in my name which I have not commanded him to speak or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. That's what I'm telling you. That's what I was telling you. That the Bible says, kill that prophet. He shouldn't live. He's, he's falsifying my word and he's going to lead people astray. God doesn't want you being led astray. That's why he gave us his perfectly preserved word in the King James Bible. Amen. If Jesus isn't who he claimed to be, then he should die. And you say, well, wait a second. He did die. No, he rose again the third day and he's alive right now. Amen? Jesus lives. Jesus lives. He laid down his life. He laid down his life. They didn't kill him. He laid down his life and he took it up again according to the scriptures. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So Jesus has to be exactly what Thomas professed him to be. Jesus has to be exactly what Thomas professed him to be. Look at John chapter 20, verse 28. John 20, 28. John 20, 28. This is after Thomas did his bit of doubting and uh, Jesus came back and appeared to him and said, put your finger in my hand, in, in my prints of my hand, th thrust your hand into my side. And look what Thomas says in John chapter 20, verse 28. And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. 
Notice that Jesus didn't retort, oh, wait a second, I'm not God, I'm just a great prophet. <laughs> and any great prophet, if they weren't God, would have corrected him. But he didn't because he is God. So I find it interesting now Thomas gets this bum rap throughout all the centuries of being doubting Thomas because he said, I'm not going to believe unless I can put my finger in his hands and my hand in his side. Uh, but clearly he proclaims exactly who Jesus is, my Lord and my God. And uh, truth be told, you've probably had more doubts in your life than Thomas ever had in his, and yet we're going to call him Doubting Thomas. I think Thomas was a great man of God. We know that they fully understood what Jesus was claiming because of verse 59 in our text. Look at verse 59, John 8, 59. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out in the midst and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. In other words, he, he must have turned invisible, because how do you walk out through the midst of them and they don't see you? And so that wraps up John chapter eight. We're ready to move on to John chapter nine. And we're gonna get just barely started. We don't have enough time to delve into it too deep, but we're going to get started with John chapter 9. So turn in your Bibles to John chapter 9. Look at verses 1 through 3. It says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. So, as we get ready to delve into this, I, I think it's important to state what may not seem too obvious. And that's, from a human standpoint, one might reach the conclusion that the Lord has lost his sense of balance. <laughs> no, he hasn't. Uh, look at Proverbs 11, verse 1. Proverbs 11, verse 1. Now, this isn't going to be obvious to a lot of people, but just hang with me for a minute. And if you don't agree, you don't agree, but just hang with me for a minute. Proverbs 11, verse 1, the Bible says, A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just way is his delight. Now look at Proverbs chapter 20, verse 23. Once again, talking about a false balance. The Bible says... Uh, Divers weights are an abomination unto the Lord and a false balance is not good. So by these two verses alone, we know that Jesus could never lose his sense of balance because he would be an abomination and Jesus wasn't an abomination. But let's consider something very peculiar about this passage as we get ready to unpack it, as my son would say. If we weigh this entire chapter in the book of John against science, religion, philosophy, intellectuality, Jesus takes time out to devote 41 verses to dealing with this one sinner. That's where somebody could say there's a false balance. Isn't that peculiar? 41 verses talking about this one person who was born blind and he only devoted 31 verses to the entire creation of the universe in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Th 31 for the entire creation of the universe, but 41 verses dealing with this one sinner. Jesus took more time to tell you about uh, this than the adulterous, or he took more to tell you about this than the adulterous woman in uh, John chapter 4. He, he spent more time telling you about that adulterous woman, 28 verses, than he spent talking about the new birth in hell in John chapter 3. <laughs> Isn't that something? Isn't that peculiar? That goes entirely against how we would write it if it was us, if, if it was our human abilities. Our ways are not God's ways. Our thoughts are not His thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways and His thoughts higher than our thoughts. We tend to think that humanity is the catch-all of all of God's plan. We're the crux. We're the center of the universe. And that's just not true. It's things like this that cause me to reach the conclusion that the real realm 
is the spiritual realm. That this uh, physical realm is, that's not what's real. The real realm is the spiritual realm. And humanity is just a very small part of that whole thing. Of that whole thing. You might want to simply meditate and pray about that. I don't know, for about the next five or six years. I don't know. So as we look at verses 1 through 3, we see a common approach of humanity in the question that his disciples ask him about this blind guy. When somebody's down, when, they're on the, when their luck seems to run out, they're down and out, we tend to look down on them as if they did something wrong. Karma, you know. Uh, what did this person do that all this grief has come upon them? And this doesn't simply apply to Christians. Some people call it karma. Uh, some say the stars are lining up against them. Some say it's just uh, uh, astrology or astronomy, whichever you choose. Uh, there's all kinds of things people say, but the automatic assumption is that you did something wrong. That's the assumption. And I've seen Christians check out of the church because of this attitude. Something happens in their life. Everybody starts looking at them different. Maybe people withdraw fellowship from them. Um, the Apostle Paul, who wrote about two-thirds of the New Testament, was also accused in the same fashion of being evil because something happened to him. Look at Acts chapter 28 and verse 1. Acts 28 and verse 1. And we're probably going to wrap up as we go through this little uh, analogy here. Um, but Acts 28 and verse 1. It says that when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. When he says no little kindness, it means they showed them a lot of kindness. It wasn't little kindness. It was a lot of kindness. For they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the uh, present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he had escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. So nobody is immune from this treatment of, of negative things happening in your life. You must be evil. You must have done something. You must have done wrong. And the reason why this is so unusual is because there really is an element of truth. The reason why it's so widely accepted, there is an element of truth to it. The law of reciprocity does exist. Sowing and reaping. For whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap. There's an element of truth to it. And God does exact judgment on people that do wrong. The Bible says to the Christian that if you're doing wrong, God's going to chasten you because he loves you, right? And uh, here's yet one more element of this record that we would say is imbalance. You see, God doesn't, doesn't do it all the time and usually it's not immediate, which brings us to a memory verse. Um, turn in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes, and if you haven't memorized this verse, you should, but turn in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11. Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 11. It says, because sen sentence against an evil word is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of man is fully set in them to do evil. So we're going to pick up with this thought next week. We're, we're out of time, but praise the Lord, we're in John chapter 9. Amen. And so we'll pick up with this thought next week. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we do thank you for this day. We praise you for it. We pray that this message would be meaningful to people, that they might see things that they've never seen before. We love you, Lord Jesus. We praise you. We honor you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.